Welcome to the Journal Editorial Report. I'm Paul Gigo, and we're live this week with special coverage of the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh, who was sworn in last night as an associate justice of the Supreme Court. The final 52-48 vote followed a bitter 90-day battle marked by uncorroborated allegations of sexual assault and unprecedented scrutiny of Kavanaugh's high school and college behavior. But his fate all but sealed on Friday with the announcement by Senator Susan Collins of Maine that she'd vote in favor of his confirmation. Certain fundamental legal principles about due process, the presumption of innocence and fairness do bear on my thinking and I cannot abandon them. The allegations failed to me the more likely than not standard. Therefore, I do not believe that these charges can fairly prevent Judge Kavanaugh from serving on the court. Let's bring in Wall Street Journal columnist and deputy editor Dan Henninger, columnist Kim Strassel, editorial page writer Kate Batchelder odell and columnist and Manhattan Institute senior fellow Jason Riley. So, Dan, you've written that uh, this whole confirmation fight is a watershed moment for American politics. Uh, tell us why. Yeah, I think it was both watershed and defining. And I guess the best way to describe that, Paul, would be to put it inside the context of Susan Collins' speech on the floor of the Senate, which was a long speech, but she took us through the Kavanaugh confirmation process. And we all recall how the hearings began. We went through the first phase of the hearings, and that was about Brett Kavanaugh's jurisprudence. They talked to him about Roe v. Wade, abortion, gay rights, the administrative state, the authority of the president. Now. You can agree or disagree on those things. You can say, I would not vote for Brett Kavanaugh on the basis of his responses. Then the hearings went into a second phase, surprisingly and suddenly. And that was the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford, which ultimately came down to her word, no corroboration. And it sustained that level. And so you saw the country dividing between people who said, I believe Christine, or as Susan Collins made clear, is are there still standards of due process in this country and that was the, i think the watershed it was surprising to me really how many people how many liberals how many democrats decided to simply say i don't care what the details are i believe this one uncorroborated accusation jason who do you think in the end after that moment who saved the nomination for kavanaugh because it was in jeopardy there for a while I'd have to say it was Susan Collins uh, who, who saved it. I think her speech was, uh, was I, I took this, I had the same takeaway from the speech that, that Dan did. They could find nothing in the jurisprudence that was disqualifying, so they switched, moved the goalpost, and they made it about his character and his temperament. And Susan Collins brought it back to the fundamentals here. She talked about fairness and the presumption of innocence and due process. And unfortunately, many on the left wanted to throw that out the window in order to stop President Trump from appointing someone to the court. She said, as a country, that would be a, a very slippery slope. Kim, what about the role here of Kavanaugh himself? Because uh, it seems to me that he played a decisive role in saving his own nomination by the performance he gave at that hearing. He's got a lot of criticism for his, his uh, forcefulness there. But I don't. I think if that he had not said what he said and even challenged the Democrats on their strategy, it would not have given the Republican senators the confidence to stand by him. Yeah, I fundamentally agree. That was what he had to do at that hearing. Uh, some people will say that's what lost him Murkowski's vote, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, because she claimed it was judicial temperament, that that was the reason she voted against him. I don't really buy that. I think she had other reasons that she was already intending not to vote for him. Um, but look, overall, Paul, this was a team effort. I think a lot of people get credit. It isn't just Brett Kavanaugh. It isn't just Susan Collins for sticking with her principles. It was uh, Mitch McConnell who made clear this vote was going to happen one way or another and that people were going to have to go and declare where they were. Uh, it was Chuck Grassley who worked very hard to make sure all of these senators, especially the nervous ones, had everything they needed um, and, and to be able to say that they had looked through this carefully. So, and the White House for sticking with the nominee as well, too. So a lot of people deserve some credit at this moment. Uh, Kate, uh, do you think that Joe Manchin, the West Virginia Democrat, would have voted yes if Susan Collins had not? 
Right. I mean, that was the apocalyptic scenario, Paul, was that uh, Collins would vote no and then Manchin would reverse his vote and say, I'm also voting no. What do you think would have happened? Exactly what do you think would have happened? Well, I think that's probably what he would have done, given that it wasn't exactly a profile in courage that he announced that he would stay a yes on Kavanaugh only after Susan Collins went to the floor and announced that she was also a yes. What, uh, uh, what about Donald Trump's role here? Did it help or hurt Kate? Well, I mean, for the most part, I think he was uh, mostly helpful in that he stayed mostly quiet. I think his one foray into this did not improve the process because I think Dr. Ford from Congress got a very respectful, decent treatment that she deserved about the allegations she was making. So I think Trump, for the most part, was helpful, but mostly by staying silent. Dan? Yeah, well, you know, Republicans were nervous about this. They were nervous what women, how they might react to uh, Christine Ford's accusations. And so the hearing ultimately ended up being an emotional event, by and large. And we have to credit Lindsey Graham as well for taking the spirit of the moment and just attacking the Democrats in a way that I think that Trump's fortitude pulled the Republicans together. They stayed the course. Judge Kavanaugh stayed the course. And there was a lot of moments there where it could have gone the other way. All right, we'll have more on the nomination still ahead. Uh, Democrats attack the Supreme Court's legitimacy in the wake of the Kavanaugh confirmation. So was the process leading up to yesterday's vote fair? And what are the prospects for future judicial nominations in the Senate? Democrats now questioning the legitimacy of the Supreme Court following yesterday's confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Critics charged that the FBI's investigation of Kavanaugh, which was reopened amid allegations of sexual misconduct, was limited and incomplete. Senator Dianne Feinstein tweeting yesterday, quote, confirming Brett Kavanaugh in the face of credible allegations of sexual assault that were not thoroughly investigated and his belligerent partisan performance in last Thursday's hearing undermines the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Greg Nunziata served as nominations counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee during the confirmations of Justices John Roberts and Samuel Alito. Welcome back. Good to have you uh, with us again. Thanks for having so me. So you've written, you wrote this week that the FBI handling of this probe, the second probe in particular, the last week, was exactly by the book and how they should have handled it. Explain why. Well, this is a typical process, and senators should know that. The FBI does this comprehensive background investigation. Occasionally, something comes up uh, later in the process that the Senate decides uh, it, the FBI maybe missed something. Maybe right. it would be useful for them to talk to a few more people. And they then order what is called or request what is called a supplemental investigation. Uh, that's what happened here. A supplemental investigation is uh, limited by its nature. The idea is they go out and conduct interviews uh, that they didn't conduct before. They get a little more information in front of the Senate. They, they, they plug in a couple of holes. Senators knew that. That's why when Feinstein and Schumer were demanding a supplemental investigation, they kept saying, this will only take a few days. Uh, they knew what they were asking for. They got what they asked for, and now they're trying to uh, characterize it as something, uh, uh, something unusual when it wasn't. But should they have interviewed more witnesses? I mean, some people are saying they didn't interview the FBI, interview uh, Ms. Ford again, for example. Uh, uh, you know, it w was it incomplete? Yeah, well, I think that just confuses what the nature of this is. The FBI, when it looks into a background, they're not trying to come to a conclusion. They're trying to gather information for the Senate to <clears throat> consider. The Senate had already heard from uh, Dr. Ford for over three hours. On top of that, she testified under oath that she right. had nothing more to add. So I, it, it, it would be peculiar to me if they uh, went and interviewed uh, Dr. Ford. Do you think that this uh, report, these pages, uh, which only senators and staff have seen, should be made public? Well, I know that some uh, some some have been asking for that. It, uh, uh, the, speak, uh, uh, the former speaker uh, uh, Pelosi has called for a, a FOIA uh, request here. Uh, it might be helpful, frankly, uh, to, to show the American people uh, how what was in there. I mean, we have to assume the, the FBI would have talked to hundreds, or at least 100 people, uh, multiple times over six investigations, and the Senate made a decision about uh, Judge Kavanaugh based on that that record, which I'm, I, I suspect uh, was quite glowing. But the problem is, you know, that we we 
this whole system of background investigations works the way it does because it's confidential. Right. That's how you get so many former colleagues and associates, people who might practice before the Supreme Court someday, willing to go and tell an FBI investigator uh, what they their experience with a nominee was, including things that are perhaps sensitive. And some, um, and some of the some of what you see in those background checks, because I've seen, I, yeah. I saw one done on me, for example, for <laughs> yeah. uh, many many years ago. It's uh, it's hearsay. Uh, it's oh. just somebody just talking off the cuff, and uh, uh, you know you see that sort of stuff, and is, you have to ask if that's questions of fairness there. No, no that's that's absolutely true, and there there are confidential sources, uh, completely confidential, even from the Senate, uh, who just say, "Hey, I heard this." And look, when when the FBI goes out and speaks to a hundred of your former associates. Uh, former romantic partners, disgruntled business associates, they're going to find a few people who have something nasty to say about you, which may not be true. Uh, so you know, again, this is the FBI report is not findings. It's not a conclusion. It's just gathering raw data and testimony. Well, so when, when people start to say this throws into doubt the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, what does that mean? Does that mean that somehow people will stop uh, uh, following the Supreme Court rulings, that they'll just say, no, I'm not going to enforce that? Yeah, I, it, no, it doesn't. I don't see any real reason that it, it throws into question the legitimacy of the court, except that some Democrats find it helpful to start talking that way. Just a few months ago, these same Democrats were very concerned that the president once used the phrase so-called judges because that undermined confidence in the judiciary. Uh, that, this is dangerous talk they're engaging in now, trying to convince uh, the country to disrespect uh, final rulings of the highest court in the land. So some Democrats also talking about impeachment if they take the House. Of course, the House impeaches, the Senate then goes to a, uh, uh, a, a trial. Uh, is that uh, something that you would see possible here? They're talking about maybe perjury, maybe uh, his temperament? Sure. I mean, I think it's, it's possible. Uh, I, I think it would be a mistake for them to go down that road. I can't imagine a world in which they would get the supermajority needed in the Senate to remove uh, Justice Kavanaugh from office based on this terribly thin record and, and frankly, trumped up charges on, on perjury. Uh, so uh, it will not result in Justice Kavanaugh being removed from the court. But will they try to hold hearings or have an investigation? They may. Uh, I'm not sure that that's a, a good campaign message for them. I think a lot of folks are, are ready to, to turn the page on, on, on the messiness of the circus that we've seen for the last few weeks. All right, Greg Nunciata, thanks very much for being here. Appreciate Thank it. You, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Still ahead, Democrats vowing not to give up the fight following Kavanaugh's confirmation yesterday. So just what do they have planned if they take back the House? in November. Democrats vowing not to give up the fight following yesterday's confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Congressman Jerry Nadler of New York telling the New York Times that Democrats will open an investigation into allegations of sexual misconduct and perjury against Brett Kavanaugh if they win control of Congress in November. Mr. Nadler, who is set to become chairman of the Judiciary Committee if Democrats flip the House, is accusing Senate Republicans and the FBI of overseeing a whitewash investigation into the now Supreme Supreme Court Justice. We're back with Dan Henninger, Kim Strassel, Kate Batchelder odell and Jason Riley. So, Kate, how seriously should we take uh, the Nadler uh, comments about what what will happen if they win the House? Uh, very seriously, I think, but I ultimately don't know that they would be able to do that because the bars to success on impeachment are so high. And I noticed that they've stopped talking about impeaching the president for the purposes of the midterms, right, because they know that that will turn the public against them. So and I don't know how seriously to take it, but I'm inclined to think it is just fictional. Well, do you think it's a winner politically for them running up to the midterms? Absolutely not, no. And that's why I think they've stopped talking about uh, impeaching the president is because the American public uh, elected Donald Trump in 2016, and it would be a completely ridiculous circus to start removing him and his entire government. Kate, uh, also in these, I mean, and uh, excuse me, uh, Kim, also in these hearings, we saw that three potential Democratic uh, candidates for president, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, and Amy Klobuchar, all were on stage, and they looked to be doing something of an audition uh, for presidents and the nomination. How do you think they did, and how did they look? Well, look, that audition was for one particular group. It was for the liberal base, the progressive movement. 
um, and to the degree that there is nothing you can do uh, too radical to turn off that bass, in fact, that is what you do to excite them, um, they all performed very admirably with their Spartacus moments, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, now, the question always will be, uh, d does that, however, it, it might help them in a primary, might help them on that platform and, and to get better known among those communities, uh, but I is that a, a winner overall for the Democratic Party? Again, it's a more evidence of the shift left that we're seeing on that side. Jason, uh, the, um, uh, talk about the illegitimacy of the Supreme Court. Think about that for a second. What does that mean? Well, when, you, what, when you hear when you hear yeah. that, what do you think it means, or is it a slogan? I think it is a slogan. But what struck me about uh, the tweet uh, that you you showed earlier was that it came from Diane Feinstein. This is not some hard left progressive. This is not Kamala Harris or Elizabeth Warren right. or Cory Booker. This is Diane Feinstein questioning the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. And and I, I see a natural progression here. First, they went after the executive branch. Donald Trump is illegitimate. He didn't win the popular vote. Or Russian bots got him elected or so forth. Or Jim Comey got him elected. But he's not legitimate. And now they've moved on to the judiciary. It seems to me their only, their only uh, standard here is if they don't control a branch of government, it's not legitimate. Well, remember, I mean, in the 1950s, we had Brown v. Board of Education, right, that said we're going to integrate the schools in the South. Yeah. And there was what was known then as massive resistance by Southern governments saying the Supreme Court is illegitimate. What you had to do was you had to have federal officials help to integrate the schools. Is that where we are here as a nation? It seems that way. I mean, you go back to the comments made a little while back by Maxine Water, harass people on the streets. Um, very few people, uh, you know, I, I think are, are walking that back. They, they, they agree with her. And, and other leadership officials have, have agreed with her as well. I, a lot of chatter about how uh, divided the country is, Dan. Some serious people even saying maybe as divided as before the Civil War. You, you, you agree with that? I think the country is divided. I mean, the polls started to show that they were divided. Polarization started with George W. Bush, another quote unquote illegitimate president, the left said, because of the Florida recount, the hanging right. chads. And that's when it started. Then the polarization actually increased during Barack Obama's years. Everyone thought Obama was kind of a calming personality. No polarization increased. So the divide is very serious. I think the big question, Paul, is not so much on the right. I mean, the alt-right disappeared in this. It's just Republicans and conservatives. On the left, the question is, are all Democrats going to follow the lead of the progressives in the kind of resistance Jason was describing? Donald Trump, in his rallies, has now begun to describe them as the radical Democrats, the radical left. They are self-defining themselves that way, and will that carry with with the general well, if they, electorate? Well, if, if they've taken Dianne Feinstein yeah. over to that, that suggests that maybe they 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 will. But it, it's also they they've shown a willingness here to 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 politicize the court to a gr degree we haven't seen before. I think, or, or not in a very long time. The, the, the Republicans have been much more willing to vote for Democratic nominees to the court than the reverse. And, and that's become more so as the, in the more recent nominees. So this is not advice and consent on the court for, for Democrats. It's a grudge match now. And uh, Kim, if Democrats retake the Senate uh, in November and next year run the Senate, will they confirm any presidential nominee for the Supreme Court or, or even the appellate courts? No, absolutely not. And everyone needs to understand that. You know, Lindsey Graham was on television today holding that list of judges that Donald Trump had put together. And he said, is there a single person on here that Chuck Schumer would ever agree to? And of course, the answer is no. Um, and they will shut down that uh, and make sure that the, the president cannot do anything more in terms of a judicial remake. Wow. OK, when we come back amid accusations of political bias, Brett Kavanaugh gets set to take his seat on the Supreme Court this week. We'll look at the term ahead and what kind of justice he will be. This whole two week effort has been a calculated and orchestrated political hit fueled with apparent pent-up anger about President Trump and the 2016 election, fear that has been unfairly stoked about my judicial record, revenge on behalf of the Clintons, and millions of dollars in money from outside left-wing opposition groups. 
That was an angry Brett Kavanaugh at last month's Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. And as he prepares to take his seat on the Supreme Court this week, critics are pointing to that performance to argue that Kavanaugh lacks judicial temperament. They also claim that the political nature of his remarks will require that he recuse himself from certain high court cases going forward. Ilya Shapiro is editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Welcome. Good to have you again. Let's take that judicial temperament point first. Do you think that this is going to affect this trial the, the judge has been through is going to affect him uh, and his jurisprudence? Well, it might affect him psychologically. Clarence Thomas has written that, that his trial by fire uh, sort of steeled himself and, and made him a different judge than he was before. Brett Kavanaugh, I mean, he seems very um, well adjusted. Uh, you know, there's difference between judicial temperament uh, when you've been accused of gang rape and, and all the right. rest of it versus uh, 12 years on the bench and glowing reviews. Uh, you know, I've seen him in person, how he acts as a judge, and no complaints uh, in, in that regard. So I think um, he'll be just fine being on the bench and settling in. The first year on the Supreme Court is always uh, an adjustment process, being among the nine. But in terms of that kind of temperament, I, I don't see a problem. Uh, of him uh, quickly settling in. So Supreme Court justices that I've talked to all, they say that every time a new justice comes, er, arrives, and somebody leaves, the dynamics within the court change somehow, and in many, sometimes in unpredictable ways. How do you think uh, Kavanaugh will change this court? I think that's right. Even if his vote on a given case would be exactly the same of what Justice Kennedy, the seat he's filling, uh, would have done, uh, in terms of uh, which areas of law he's most interested or uh, expert in, like administrative law, pushing back on the executive state, uh, or structure, uh, constitutional structure, separation of powers. Kennedy nece doesn't, wasn't necessarily focused on those things, so maybe he will write more in those areas, speak up more in those kinds of cases, even if his eventual vote would be like Kennedy. And then behind the scenes, a, a small group dynamic, psychologist will tell you, <laughs> right. really will change, so uh, in unpredictable ways. So if they now, people are saying, well, there's now a solid 5-4 conservative majority, but of course, Depends on how you define conservative. Uh, how do you give us some examples? You mentioned the administrative state, but give us some examples of other issues where you think that actual rulings could change. Well, there's very few of the uh, kind of big, high-profile ones. I, I did a piece a couple of months ago uh, looking at what the uh, scientific survey of my Twitter feed and what sort of the top eight areas that progressives were most upset about. And most of them, there's no change. Uh, Kennedy was already with the conservatives on arbitration and worker rights and right. corporate power, campaign finance, et cetera, et cetera. The biggest one, I think, that will or has the potential of changing is affirmative action and racial preferences. Uh, trial starts in two weeks in Boston, a lawsuit against uh, Harvard University. If and when that gets up to the Supreme Court in uh, two years or so, that could be a big change in this 40-year-old experiment with use of racial preferences. Uh, other things, maybe uh, Roe v. Wade or abortion gets talked about, but remember, John Roberts is the middle of the court, the chief justice. We haven't had a chief justice in the middle of the court jurisprudentially in quite some time, since the 30s, I think. And so things like that will only go as far and as fast as he wants to take them. Let me give you another example, though, and see what you think about it, and that's gun rights. For, because, for example, the court has not taken a case uh, challenging a uh, state and local regulation of gun rights in quite some time, maybe even since major case since the two big ones, Heller and McDonald, several years ago. Now, I believe that they didn't take it because they didn't know that the conservatives didn't think that maybe they had a five-vote majority. Now, with Kavanaugh, that could be a difference. I think that's right. You need four votes to take up a case. And so if the four more conservative justices than Roberts uh, uh, vote that way to take up these cases, I think the court will have that majority. And I think it should take up the cases, however it ends up ruling, because there's really been chaos and civil disobedience, really, in the lower courts about the scope of the right that Heller introduced. In the Supreme Court, it's about time. It's been a decade. They really need to flesh it out. You mentioned Chief Justice John Roberts being the, uh, the now the centrist on the court. I guess it depends on how you define centrist. But I would define him more as an incrementalist and an institution. Institutionalist. He's not somebody who's going to want to say, oh boy, now I've got a five vote majority here. Let's have a bunch of five, four decisions and roll over all kinds of precedents willy nilly. He's going to be, he's going to do things slowly by degrees. And he might try to even get uh, Elena Kagan and, and Stephen Breyer on his side to, to form a majority for, for some of these decisions. 
I think that's right, and we saw that dynamic a little bit in the previous eight justice court after Justice Scalia died, where indeed there was sort of this centrist coalition with uh, left and right uh, dissenters or, or concurrences. And you're right, just because Roberts is the median vote, the middle of the court, doesn't mean he's a centrist himself. He is a conservative, but he is a minimalist. And so, uh, as we've seen in various areas of law, from campaign finance to voting rights to other things, uh, it takes several cases to move in a particular direction. So he is certainly not looking uh, off the bat to overturn cases or set broad precedents. And because he's the chief, he has a certain ability to steer opinions, if he's in the majority, to certain judges who might write a more minimalist uh, opinion. That, that's right. That He only gets one vote, but if he's in the majority, he will assign the writing. Now, we have to be careful about this. If it's five or six justices in the majority, he makes an assignment, and it turns out the other three or four think that that's too narrow, then he'll lose his plurality effectively. Right. All right. Thank you, Ilya Shapiro. Appreciate you coming in. My pleasure. Still ahead, the Kavanaugh confirmation coming just weeks before the midterm election. So has the bitter fight moved the poll numbers in key races? We'll ask Carl Rove next. Over the past few weeks, every American has now seen the profound stakes in the upcoming election. You now see it. We have been energized. We have been energized. The Kavanaugh confirmation coming at a pivotal time, with just a month to go until the midterm elections. And amid the bitter fight over his nomination, voter enthusiasm among, among Republicans has soared, with a new poll showing a once clear Democratic advantage all but disappearing. In July, that poll showed a 10-point gap between the number of Democrats and Republicans saying the November elections were very important. Now that is down to just two points, a statistical tie. Wall Street Journal columnist and Fox News contributor Carl Rove is a former senior advisor to President George W. Bush. So, uh, Carl, uh, the uh, majority leader of the Senate, said, uh, uh, Mitch McConnell said, I want to thank the mob for uh, mobilizing Republicans here. Is that what you're seeing really in the polling across the country? Well, I think the general issue is what's motivating them. Uh, and I think in particular two things. One is the sense that this was a last minute hit with no corroboration. And, that, uh, and then secondly, that the Democrats seem to assume that if you make the allegation and you don't have any proof, uh, that individual is still guilty. I think those two things, the process and the and the standard that's being applied here is what's uh, energized a lot of Republicans. And the question is going to be whether or not uh, they feel that strongly in just over 30-some-odd uh, days uh, when they go to the polls and start to vote. Yeah. Do you see any evidence now in any particular races that it is uh, making a difference? Uh well, I, look, I think I think it already made a difference in North Dakota. I think uh, Kevin Kramer had been doing so well there that I think at the end of the day, Heidi Heidkamp decided that since she looks like she, you know, right now he leads by an average of 8.7 points in the real clear politics average, I think Heidi Heidkamp basically said, I'm, 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 I'm going to pretty up my resume for service in the next Democratic presidential administration and came out against him. But yeah, I do think it's a problem, particularly for Joe Donnelly in Indiana, who on the 28th came out against Kavanaugh saying, we need to have an FBI investigation. Uh, later that day, the FBI began uh, the, the follow-up review, and so now he's got to be in a place where he says, you know, I came out against him because I wanted an FBI investigation, but somehow or another the FBI hasn't done a sufficient, a, a good enough job to, uh, to, to assuage my concern. So he got a problem. But, yes, it's a problem in, in, in every state where... Uh, Trump won by a big margin, Montana, West Virginia, where Manchin solved the problem by voting for him. But I think it's also a problem for Democrats in states that are much more narrowly balanced. You'll notice, for example, in Nevada, Jackie Rosen, the Democrat, has yet to run a TV ad attacking Dean Heller on, on his vote, though she has done a digital ad. And in Arizona, Kristen Sinema kept, the Democrat kept very quiet on this all the way to the end. Well, if you were, so if you were the Republican candidates in those races, would you now use the Supreme Court as a wedge issue to try to generate more enthusiasm and, and pull some independence to your side? Or do you risk then more mobilizing the other side more? Well, look, this issue is going to be used by the Democrats to mobilize their base, no ifs, ands, or buts. And, and, and here's the, the trick. Here's the problem. Here's the challenge, if you will. Take a look at two polls last week. The NPR and the Marist poll ask if there is still a doubt about whether the charges are true should... Uh, 
uh, Kavanaugh be confirmed or not? 40 percent said don't uh, said confirm him. 52 percent said did not. On the Harvard Harris poll, though, said if the FBI review of these allegations finds no corroboration, should you vote to confirm? 60 percent confirm. 40 percent don't confirm. So whoever makes the better argument, the Democrats are going to go out there and say, uh, you know, their doubts. The Republicans need to go out there and say, with all due respect, the FBI did a review. They found no corroboration. The four people named by Dr. Ford, with all due respect to her, none of them could co corroborate or verify her claims. And, and fairness dictates that we, you know, in America, we believe in the presumption of innocence right. until proven guilty. And, and none of the people that were identified by either uh, Dr. Ford or Dr. or Ms. Ramirez were able to corroborate the charges. But the Republicans have got to make you, the case. But Otherwise, would you go, they could... But would you go up with an ad that's, you know, made that tried to <clears throat> polarize the race along these lines? Or is that just too risky for either side, uh, 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 either Democrats or Republicans in I these very it's... close elections? I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. If the Democrats go up with an ad, the Republicans have to go up with an ad. And in the case of Indiana, I'd go up with an ad because Donnelly put himself in a bad place. I'm voting against him because I want an FBI review. I want them to investigate these charges. Well, now they've done that, and he still voted no. Have any of the senators, other than North Dakota, in your view, really established, broken out, in either party, to substantial leads that uh, look like they're pulling away? Well, there are only two, uh, North Dakota for the Republicans, West Virginia for the Democrats. Take a look at the Real Clear Politics average for the other races. Arizona, 3.4. Florida, 2.4. Indiana, 2.5. Montana, 3, and closing dramatically over the last month. Nevada, 2.3. Uh, Tennessee is now a two-point advantage for the Republicans, but it's moved rather dramatically. I think that's on the verge of breaking into the Republican column pretty e effectively and strongly. But the other races are very much up for grabs, and we got plenty of time for either side uh, to, to, to sway the argument. Do you think? Way. Do you think that Joe Manchin uh, in West Virginia, with his vote for uh, Kavanaugh, has put his race away? Certainly taken away one of Patrick Morrissey's best issues. Yes. I, I think it's very t got to be very tough. Uh, he, 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 he may have been political, may not have been political, but it certainly helped him in a state that loves Donald Trump and where Donald Trump, let's see if the White House goes back in and makes the case that uh, they, need, they got his vote when they didn't need it and uh, the president needs somebody who will be with him in tough times. All right, Carl, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it you on bet. Sunday. Still ahead, much more on the political fallout from the Kavanaugh confirmation fight. So will outrage on the left help or hurt Democrats in the midterms? Our panel weighs in next. Many millions who are outraged by what happened here. There's one answer. Vote. Angry protests marking yesterday's confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. So will that anger and the left's tactics during the bitter confirmation fight help or hurt Democrats in the midterm elections? Here's Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell yesterday. As unpleasant as it's been, uh, it's been worth it. Uh, they made a tactical mistake that really helped me unify my uh, conference and turn on the Republican base going into the election. Maybe I ought to say thank you. We're back with Dan Henniger, Kim Strassel, Kate Batchelder Odell, and Jason Riley. So, uh, Kim, you heard uh, Chuck Schumer in the previous uh, segment make a statement on the Senate floor saying, vote, 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 vote. This is what you have to do. Do you think this was, and, and, and pretty clearly say that Christine Blasey Ford is going to be one of their political symbols through November. Do you think that was maybe the strategy all along here? If they couldn't defeat Kavanaugh, then use it in the election. Right. It was voter mobilization all along. I think they also were hopeful that they could stop the judge. But this was about firing up their base. And I think this is what's being missed. When, when Judge Kavanaugh was put into office this weekend, sworn in, it basically set off a referendum on his nomination and his seating on the Supreme Court. And what you're seeing is that they made a clear plea from the floor, Chuck Schumer, saying you need to go out and vote if you don't, don't like what happened here. But Republicans are starting to do that, too. So far, they've been running on a positive message, saying, look at the economy, look what we've done for you. Now they're out there saying, 
this is what you're going to get, this circus that you saw for the last three weeks if Democrats are in charge and you need to be afraid. But Jason, anger uh, at losing right. on the court is usually a bigger motivator than relief at, uh, at, at getting Judge Kavanaugh on the court. So is that maybe a better uh, advantage for the, for the Democrats? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think they overplayed their hand, Paul. Uh, they, they have a relatively unpopular president, and they thought they could just make up something about his uh, judicial picks and, and put it past the, the American people. Uh, Republicans are divided on any number of issues, but they are very much united on choosing conservative Supreme Court justices. And I think this was uh, uh, not the fight that, um, that, that didn't turn out the way Democrats thought it would turn out. You're, the goal is to, to motivate your own voters, not the other team's voters. You know, Kate, a lot of commentary around that uh, maybe uh, Donald Trump, this fight, united uh, Donald Trump with uh, the, a lot of Republicans who weren't all that happy with Donald Trump. Uh, I guess that depends in the next month for the election on how Donald Trump behaves. Uh, uh, but, uh, so, but you buy that argument that this, in fact, has been a unifying fight for uh, the conservative uh, movement. I do. I mean, the heroes of the story are Susan Collins and Lindsey Graham, who have not been conservative favorites for eight years, right? This is a... Uh, it has been a very unifying experience on the Republican side. And I would just add to Jason's point that if you think about the voters who are very angry that Kavanaugh was confirmed, a lot of them live in progressive cities that don't rep elect Republicans anyway, whereas I think some of the more moderate independent voters who looked at this process and thought it was a complete sham and that Kavanaugh was mistreated, a lot more of them might live in North Dakota or Missouri or places where Democrats really need to perform. Well, let's talk about moderate voters. I mean, clearly one of the strategies of the Democrats here was to uh, turn women, especially women in the suburbs, against the Republican Party as anti-women. Right. I'm not so sure that worked, Paul. Uh, my reading is that a lot of women out there watching this, mainly mothers and wives, concluded this could happen to my husband or this could happen to my son, an accusation without corroboration. So I'm not sure that the, the Democrats have really succeeded in pulling as they thought, all women to their side, and also the hashtag MeToo movement. Clearly now, liberals are beginning to say that is owned by progressives. Conservatives cannot be part of the Me Too movement. This is the definition of polarization, Paul, and it looks to me as though the Democrats in some ways are marginalizing themselves with these arguments. The psychology, I asked Ilya Shapiro this, Jason, I wonder what you think uh, about the psychology of going through an ordeal like this mm -hmm. for somebody like Brett Kavanaugh. If some people might think he gets on the court, he's going to spend some time trying to win over, win back yeah. those critics, mm -hmm. and does he move to the middle somehow, or does does it uh, basically say, I mean, what do you think? Well, we have examples of, of both happening. You, you have uh, the Clarence Thomas example. He was put through the ringer during his confirmation process. It did not result in him moving to the left on the court. But Republicans also remember Sandra Day O'Connor. They remember the justice that uh, Kennedy that is being replaced but they weren't, by they, Kavanaugh. They were easily confirmed. They were easily confirmed, but the question then became, uh, did they seek validation from the mainstream media? Did they care what CNN or the New York Times wrote about them? And has been the case sometimes with Republican picks for the court. Subsequently, over the years, they do start to care and, and, and shift to the leftward. So it remains to be seen. Nothing in Judge Kavanaugh's jurisprudence on the federal bench suggests that he will be anything other than a solid conservative. I hope he has the fortitude of Clarence Thomas. So, uh, Kim, one quick thing. Susan Collins, in her speech, I thought made a very pointed plea to the to to Miss. It's subtle but pointed nonetheless. That uh, uh, you know, I don't think you're going to overturn Roe v. Wade, and that might, I, and, and and Kavanaugh knows that uh, Collins provided the key vote. Will that matter? Briefly. Well, look, she was trying to define him uh, and where he could go. Uh, the, question, the point is, is he's actually a pretty uh, careful judge anyway, so I wouldn't expect major big changes there. All right. Thank you, Kim. We have to take one more break. When we come back, hits and misses of the week. Angry protests marking yesterday's confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. So will that anger and the left's tactics during the bitter confirmation fight help or hurt Democrats in the midterm elections? Here's Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell yesterday. As unpleasant as it's been, uh, it's been worth it. Uh, they made a tactical mistake that really helped me unify my uh, conference and turn on the Republican base going into the election. Maybe I ought to say thank you.
We're back with Dan Henniger, Kim Strassel, Kate Batchelder Odell, and Jason Riley. So, uh, Kim, you heard uh, Chuck Schumer in the previous uh, segment make a statement on the Senate floor saying, vote, 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 vote. This is what you have to do. Do you think this was, and, and, and pretty clearly say that Christine Blasey Ford is going to be one of their political symbols through November. Do you think that was maybe the strategy all along here? If they couldn't defeat Kavanaugh, then use it in the election. Right. It was voter mobilization all along. I think they also were hopeful that they could stop the judge. But this was about firing up their base. And I think this is what's being missed. When, when Judge Kavanaugh was put into office this weekend, sworn in, it basically set off a referendum on his nomination and his seating on the Supreme Court. And what you're seeing is that they made a clear plea from the floor, Chuck Schumer, saying you need to go out and vote if you don't, don't like what happened here. But Republicans are starting to do that, too. So far, they've been running on a positive message, saying, look at the economy, look what we've done for you. Now they're out there saying, this is what you're going to get, this circus that you saw for the last three weeks if Democrats are in charge and you need to be afraid. But, Jason, anger uh, at losing right. at the court is usually a bigger motivator than relief at, uh, at, at getting Judge Kavanaugh on the court. So is that maybe a better uh, advantage for the, for the Democrats? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think they overplayed their hand, Paul. Uh, they, they have a relatively unpopular president, and they thought they could just make up something about his uh, judicial picks and, and put it past the, the American people. Uh, Republicans are divided on any number of issues, but they are very much united on choosing conservative Supreme Court justices. And I think this was uh, uh, not the fight that, um, that, that didn't turn out the way Democrats thought it would turn out. You, the goal is to, to motivate your own voters, not the other team's voters. You know, Kate, a lot of commentary around that uh, maybe uh, Donald Trump, this fight united uh, Donald Trump with uh, the, a lot of Republicans who weren't all that happy with Donald Trump. Uh, I guess that depends in the next month for the election on how Donald Trump behaves. Uh, uh, but <laughs>